Okay, so good morning, members and friends. I'm glad to welcome you all today to our August webinar that is hosted by Fiber Connect Council, Mina. Our welcome extends to our members and their partners, and we hope all of you join our council and benefit from today's webinar. I would like to thank our council member, our Platinum member, Sterlite Technologies as well, in accepting our invitation and presenting today's webinar with an expert speaker talking about building a future ready networks with innovative fiber optic solutions with Mr. Seldon Benjamin, Principal Solutions Architect at Sterlite. Dr. Benjamin is an industry expert and veteran in the field of connectivity solutions. With more than 25 years of experience in the field of telecom, he has contributed to the development of technologies to enable new applications of fiber optics in many areas, including FTTX. He has worked across the globe in geographies such as Northern America, Africa, and the Middle East. Dr. Benjamin is currently with Sterlite, where he is responsible for a new product development and innovate, innovations in fiber, cable, and connectivity solutions that provide an advantage in the deployments of fiber optic networks. One of the recent breakthroughs being the industry's first universal fiber stellar, he has been actively involved in conducting technical workshops with global customers across the Middle East and Africa with the objective to help drive new technologies. For our attendees, please note that Mr. Sildon will answer your questions once he finishes the presentation. Mr. Sildon, I'm happy to welcome you again today. Please have the full floor. Great, thanks, Gold. Thanks for the uh, um, uh, introduction. So we'll just get right into it. Uh, I'll go over some uh, key uh, data um, in terms of growth trends and drivers. Um, a little bit on you know conventional fiber to the home, fiber to the X solutions, uh, and then uh, cover some uh, of uh, our you know solutions that hopefully will uh, you know, bring you uh, some benefits. Uh, I'd like to to point out that uh, the the solutions that I'll offer, I will use our some of examples of our products uh, uh, to demonstrate those solutions. But uh, keep in mind that. Uh, uh, you know, similar solutions are available from uh, you know, some of the other big players. Uh, really anyone who is integrated from the fiber to the cable to the connectivity piece that has all those pieces uh, can offer, also offer, you know, similar solutions. Uh, you know, here I'm thinking of, you know, maybe Corning or, or Prismium. So just wanted to, to make uh, you aware of that. And then uh, Q&A uh, at the end. So I'll start off with... Uh, you know, key uh, drivers and trends. And uh, you know, these slides, you know, may be uh, uh, somewhat familiar. You know, various slides of, of this nature are, are really kicking off any, <laughs> any fiber optic talk nowadays. But, uh, you know, some interesting uh, notes, uh, the, the blue bars on the bottom, uh, it's number of uh, billion of people uh, on the internet. Uh, interesting uh, tidbit, 2.2 uh, uh, million new users every day. And that's, uh, the, you know, up 3x from, you know, before the, the pandemic. Uh, so a lot of new years, users every day. Uh, and then obviously driving uh, more and more, more traffic. Uh, prediction is uh, the global IP traffic will, you know, grow, you know, multiple times over the next uh, three, four years. Uh, and so I think it's uh, it's our job. When I say our, I'm not talking about Sterlite. I'm talking about everybody I'm talking to here. It's our job to provide uh, the networks uh, to, uh, that can handle all of this data. Um, and, and you know, are we going to be able to do that? It looks like there is funding. Um, the the green bars here, telcos have been increasing their 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 capex spend, sort of you know on a regular basis uh, over the years. This chart ends at 2020. Uh, and it's expected that uh, you know the so the the kegger of this will kick up uh, a fair bit uh, for the next few years, maybe following something uh, similar to the prediction on the bottom here, the blue uh, uh, bars. That's uh, what's expected uh, moving forward from uh, you know the cloud uh, the companies. So pretty strong uh, kegger there, maybe uh, sort of like doubling over the next few years in terms of uh, the investment. And then where's all that money coming from? Uh, private equity, uh, they're in there. Uh, enterprises investing and uh, citizen networks uh, uh, investing pretty heavily in the US, the UK, India, uh, some pretty heavy investments. I wanted to, to just show a little bit of detail on you know, some of the things going on in our region. 
uh, some pretty big uh, uh, efforts, uh, uh, sort of government driven. Uh, uh, 2030 seems to be a, a popular date, uh, but uh, you know, many different uh, uh, strong pushes, uh, various uh, regional governments. Uh, and all of these contain some kind of a pretty serious digitization, you know, uh, you know better uh, communication systems, uh, et cetera. So uh, lots of focus uh, on the bottom there, um, sort of showing that some of the uh, GCC countries are, are sort of leading the way in terms of, for example, moving government services into the digital domain. Uh, and so uh, really in the top 10 there globally in terms of uh, those kind of uh, uh, implementations. And uh, so where is all this capital going to go? Uh, there are sort of three build cycles that are all coming together at the same time here. Uh, so uh, fiber to the X, right? No matter where we are, at home, at work, uh, we've really learned that uh, we do need to have reliable uh, high bandwidth connectivity in order to you know, do our jobs properly, in order to enjoy ourselves properly as well. Uh, uh, on top of that, new capabilities, uh, you know, coming with 5G, you know, connected everywhere. Uh, and then to make it fair, uh, pushing the, the same capability out into the rural, uh, possibly underserved uh, areas, uh, which uh, there's no shortage of uh, that type of uh, situation you know, in our, our region here. Um, what that means is more cable, more fiber. Uh, the CRU here is predicting uh, growth in optical fiber cable uh, demand to take quite a big uh, jump up uh, every year. Uh, this is, uh, you know, worldwide, this is a million fiber kilometers of uh, what they expect in terms of uh, the demand uh, as we move forward here to 2025. Um, expectation is this is not going to be a, a short cycle where we're thinking maybe a decade of uh, 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 deployments here. Um, so we're, we're going to be all be very busy. And so the, the challenge is, you know, so, so, so what's important? Uh, if we want to, you know, uh, keep up, basically, uh, we're going to need uh, uh, solutions that uh, allow us to roll the network out uh, faster. Uh, as I don't think the number of folks working in the telco industry is suddenly going to, you know, double. And so we just need to learn how to uh, uh, be more efficient, uh, have better products uh, that enable us to get things out there quicker. We also have to go everywhere now. Uh, small cells will be popping up uh, around every corner. Uh, we have to connect all of the various endpoints, all of the various uh, homes. And so uh, we need solutions that will help us facilitate deep fiberization. Uh, at the same time, um, we need solutions that uh, over time will reduce service outages. And that's all about making all of our you know, sort of quality of life better. So we're not uh, constantly trying to you know, fix a, a broken network. Uh, we, we need all this stuff, but at the same time, uh, uh, there'll be a lot of pressure to reduce the cost of the, the network build out. And so th these are sort of the, uh, the things that we need to uh, keep in mind as we you know, try to come up with new solutions. So just a real quick uh, uh, look back at, uh, you know, what do the fiber to the home solutions look like today? Um, <clears throat> so we'll not focus much on the trunk, but we'll focus a little bit more on the distribution number two and the, the drop uh, number three. Uh, we'll look at, you know, various aerial solutions, uh, underground solutions, uh, and then we'll go inside and take a look at uh, you know, how MDUs and enterprises are, are connected. Um, so what, what are the, the challenges when we really get right down to the, the optical network? Well, it's based on light. We have to get light from point A to point B. So it's all about uh, attenuation. These are sort of the ABCs of uh, uh, you know, what's important. Um, bend sensitivity. Uh, if you bend optical fiber too tight, light will fall out, uh, so we're, we're talking about physics here. And uh, um, as networks become more crowded, uh, maybe as uh, you know, we have to broaden our technician base, maybe they're not as used to, to dealing with and managing fiber. Uh, it, it, I think it's pretty clear that uh, uh, optical loss uh, due to bend is going to be more of a, a problem moving forward. 
Um, and if we are you know, looking at new solutions and making changes, we have to make sure that uh, whatever we, we, we switch to or put in place is compatible not only with the legacy uh, net, uh, networks that are out there and, and optical fibers that are out there, but also what's coming in the future, you know, what's coming around the corner. What we need to put in today has to be compatible with uh, uh, you know, that requirement. So uh, I mentioned uh, Bend is uh, uh, likely to become more and more of an issue as we move forward. So let's take a look at uh, Bend's. Um, um, <clears throat> and some of the solutions that uh, we have around uh, uh, optical bends and networks. Um, it does happen, bend happens. Uh, this is uh, just a one example um, of where uh, the red square is showing where a optical fiber is bent below sort of the design radius of, uh, for that tray. So it, it does happen. The, this particular tray is not particularly crowded. Uh, uh, as trays become more crowded, more and more fiber you know, sort of in the same space, and this problem will become uh, more of an issue. As we broaden our tech base as well, uh, folks uh, not as used to dealing with fiber, it will also become an issue. Uh, and, and both of those those things will happen uh, as we move forward with our, our networks. So why is uh, um, Bend important? Where where is it more critical? I guess is uh, is uh, one. Doctor Sunzen. Yes. Sorry, I have to interrupt you, but um, I guess some of our audience they can't hear anything. Mm -hmm. uh, no sound. I believe we can hear uh, Doctor Sunzen very well. So please. If you can check your devices, mm -hmm. okay, fine. So, so you you can hear. Um, is it? Yeah, for me, I can hear. Um, I guess two of our audience they can't hear, but the rest they can hear mm -hmm. very clear. So I guess uh, the problem not from our mm -hmm. side. Sorry, okay. Doctor. So then you can continue, please. Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, so the. Uh, um, mm, where, where is the uh, optical bend and fiber going to hit us uh, the hardest? And uh, uh, let's take a look at what we're trying to do in the fiber to home networks first. Um, they're, they're getting quite crowded and uh, we're, we're trying to you know, find new space to live. Um, we already have uh, you know, GPON, uh, XSG PON, NG PON. Uh, carriers are already using uh, coexistence elements to try and uh, put even multiple pawns onto uh, like GPON and XSG pawn, try to put those on to the network at the same time. And so we're, we're rapidly sort of using up the available wavelength. Um, you, you, you have uh, you know, wireline wireless network convergence. And so then the question is, um, you know, where, uh, where do you put small cells uh, in this, this wavelength plan? Do you want to try to put small cells onto your, your passive optical network? Uh, and so it's pushing us to the extremes, uh, short wavelength, but also to the longer wavelength, out into the L-band, uh, maybe pushing pond monitoring to the extreme of the L-band or even further. Uh, and the point is we are gonna need all the wavelengths. In particular, we're gonna need the, the long wavelengths. Um, and why bend loss is a, is an issue at the long wavelength is uh, it is quite high and it it, it, it uh, sort of like the you know data usage curve it has the same shape so as you go to longer wavelength uh, the optical loss due to bending an optical fiber goes through the roof in particular for G six five two D fiber which is uh, uh, you know uh, legacy fiber that is deployed in in, in many networks uh, out there today. Uh, it has uh, very poor performance uh, uh, in the L band in particular at the long wavelengths. Uh, even a relatively you know minor bend here, one turn at 7.5 millimeter radius, and at the longest uh, uh, wavelength on this chart, 1650, uh, you're talking about 16 dB. So very very high loss for D fiber uh, in the L band uh, or the U band. Uh, G657A1, uh, it's the, the lower curve, the second lowest curve there, is uh, somewhat better. Um, maybe at the edge of the L-band, 1630-ish, uh, maybe you've got uh, about 2 dB, so that's still a lot of loss for a single you know, radius uh, turn. Uh, and then you have G657A2, which is a, you know, an optical fiber uh, optimized for low bend loss, and really it's good to use out into the, the L band all the way to the 
edge of the U band, 16, 15 nanometer, um, even at this uh, you know um, uh, bend radius. So what is special about A2 fiber? Uh, what what makes it work? Uh, just real quick, on the left here, we have a refractive index profile on the bottom and then sort of an end view of the optical fiber uh, on the top. Uh, that small white thing in the middle is the core of the optical fiber. That's where the optical the, the signal travels and you want it to stay in that core in order for it to get to the other end. Uh, ref refractive index profile on the bottom shows that the index of the, the core is a bit higher than the, the rest of the optical fiber or the cladding. And that's uh, what sort of traps the light inside the, the core and guides it down the fiber. Now, if you bend the optical fiber too tightly, the light will fall out of this core. Uh, if you go to the refractive index profile for the A2 fiber, which is in the center here, uh, at the you know, center bottom, you see there's these two depressions. So there's a, what we call a trench. It's put around the core, and that trench uh, you know, helps uh, keep uh, the light uh, in the core, even if uh, the optical fiber is bent uh, quite uh, sharply. So that's a relatively simple concept, uh, adding a trench to keep the light in the core, uh, but uh, you know, sort of works like magic almost. Uh, uh, if you look at the chart here, 4 dB uh, for one turn at 7.5 millimeter radius for uh, OH light, which is our D fiber. Uh, then you go down to A1 fiber, and then all the way to the, the right is uh, you know very very low loss uh, for the same uh, bend radius for bolide E, which is our you know standard uh, A2 fiber. So you know as an engineer, I look at this and it's like, why in the world don't we make all fiber with uh, a trench? It's just uh, so much better in terms of keeping the light uh, in the actual fiber. Um, so there is a bit of a, a challenge, uh, you know, why, why don't we just use this A2 fiber everywhere? You know, the, the issue is that the traditional A2 designs uh, have a smaller core. So there is a, a, a challenge in uh, matching the um, A2 fiber core to the uh, D fiber core. Uh, here, here's just one example of an issue that, that arises. Um, the mode field diameter um, uh, of uh, a2 fiber is smaller, uh, so the uh, the little diagram uh, labeled mode field diameter variation uh, shows that um, um, the A2 fiber with a small core, and then you go to a D fiber with a larger core, and then A2 fiber with a smaller core. Uh, the OTDR signal, uh, which is uh, just to the right of that, where you see step and gainer labeled, will have some uh, sort of unphysical uh, errors in the OTDR uh, signal. Uh, so what happens is you're not, allowed, you're not able to get an accurate measure of the, the loss of the network using an OTDR uh, uh, trace. And, and that really complicates trying to qualify these networks whenever you have a transition from D to A2 or A2 to D uh, fibers. So the, the solution seems sort of obvious, right? Um, the, the problem is that the, the legacy fiber has a, a core of, let's say, 9.1 micron. That's our, our standard core for our D fiber. Uh, and then the typical A2s that are out there uh, have a, a smaller core. In our case, it's 8.6 micron core. So uh, on the bottom there, uh, right, why don't you just make an A2 fiber with uh, you know, a, a D core? And that's, uh, that's what we've, uh, we've done. Launched it about uh, a year ago. Um, you may wonder why it wasn't done in the first place. Well, I think it's uh, you know uh, evolution of the process control, and uh, it's easier to achieve A2 performance if you have a smaller core, and that's uh, uh, you know was was uh, uh, you know applied uh, back when these these fibers were first uh, you know developed and, and released. Uh, now, with you know further process advancements and further understanding how they make these fibers, uh, it's, it's possible now to make a, a fiber with a D core uh, without, uh, uh, and still achieve the A2 uh, performance. <clears throat> so, um, you know, we, we can deploy a bend resistant fiber uh, in uh, our network and it will interact uh, seamlessly with the legacy uh, plant 
what and so that's all fiber to the home. I just want to take a quick and aside. What about you know the backbone part of the network? What about long haul? You know, it's most of the long haul networks are still based on a D fiber, and if a, if this uh, stellar fiber has a D core, then you know logically you would think that it would be also okay for long haul systems. And so we uh, you know did some uh, measurements uh, in our, our test facility. Uh, <clears throat> simulated, uh, you know, a moderate uh, length uh, uh, transmission here up to 480 kilometers. Uh, the chart on the bottom sort of says it all. You've got uh, the green is our D fiber, the blue is our the new Stellar. Uh, and these, these curves basically green and blue for um, 100 gig, that's the, the upper curves, and then 200 gig, which is the, the lower curves. They, the blue and green are basically on top of each other, telling us that uh, not, not, not that surprising, but just confirming that, yes, the, the D fiber and the stellar fiber with the D core, they performed the same in these uh, long haul uh, uh, measurements. Uh, you know, but then, you know, uh, you will also still have the, the low bend loss uh, um, benefit of the stellar fiber also in, in the long haul networks. So just sort of a sum summary of uh, the, the stellar fiber. Um, A2 performance, but with a D core, which is you know backward compatible with what you already have. Uh, future ready because of the the uh, low bend loss at the long wavelengths. Um, you know uh, some some cost savings due to easier first time install. Um, even if you do have a small accidental bend, you're still going to be able to bring that network up right away and have a you know, sort of first right uh, first time right uh, deployment. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, if you go to the other big guys in the industry, you know, you're, you're going to be able to find similar uh, products that have been, you know, uh, recently released. Okay, let's uh, take a look at uh, uh, not only just the fiber piece, let's go to the next uh, step, which is uh, drop cable uh, solutions. So what are the challenges uh, with uh, you know, connecting up, uh, you know, that last cable to connect up customer by customer by customer. Most of the solutions uh, deployed in, in the region involve, uh, on the bottom there, you can see uh, either a, a field installable connector, which, which does require some, some skill to properly, uh, you know, prepare the fiber, uh, insert the fiber, secure the fiber for the field installable connector, uh, some skills involved there. Or on the right bottom, uh, maybe you're going to be doing fusion splicing. Uh, again, now you need some specialized equipment. You need a splicing machine. You need a, a splicing tech. Uh, and so there's a uh, possibility that you're going to slow down your deployment because uh, you need uh, higher level skill folks. Maybe you, you, you don't have them available in the quantities you, you need to do a rapid uh, rollout. Um, also, you're introducing you know, some potential failure points, you're induce, introducing a splice, you're introducing a field installable connector, which you know, can have some reliability issues. Uh, I think also what's critical uh, is that you're going into that uh, uh, closure on, on the, the bottom right, you have to open it up, you have to take that drop cable into that, you have to disturb other fibers that are likely already connected to customers, you're, you're going into the live network and touching it which uh, uh, you know, can lead to lots of uh, uh, you know, uh, service calls uh, to go back and uh, you install the drop cable to add customer Y, but now customer C has a problem and someone has to go fix it. So going into those closures and touching the live network is, uh, is not a good idea uh, if, if it can be avoided. So, um, one solution is to, to do pre-connectorization so that uh, you don't have to touch that network. Uh, you hopefully can reduce the skill level required. Uh, so here's a, an example uh, of an IP68 ruggedized outdoor connector. Uh, this is sort of based on technology which has been out in the industry for quite some time. Uh, maybe not all that uh, innovative or new, but what is new is uh, you know, uh, this kind of technology will be more widely available uh, from uh, you know, different suppliers, including Sterlite, uh, as we move forward. Uh, and you know, possibly at uh, uh, 
I think in, in the past, uh, the sort of the pricing level of, of these products was sort of, uh, and, and availability uh, was, was uh, prevented it from you know, widespread use in, in, for example, in this uh, region. Um, here we've paired it with a, a nice round drop cable, which has zero preferential bend, so it's really easy to handle. Uh, it can be uh, you know, installed with the standard uh, spiral clamps. Uh, compatible with both aerial and underground deployment. So you can sort of take one cable, one drop cable solution and use it to wherever uh, that you, you need to go. And so uh, reduces the, the skill level. You're not uh, necessarily doing any, any splicing, certainly not outdoors. Um, and uh, you're not uh, going in to disturb or touch the live network. And let me go to the next slide to sort of demonstrate how that works. So in terms of, of the live network, uh, when you roll out, uh, you'll install these uh, um, uh, distribution terminals, and they're all sort of pre-stubbed. And so once you've rolled out your, your network, you haven't necessarily connected uh, all of your users. Um, but you know this is already installed. It's sealed up. Uh, you can't even necessarily open it in most cases. So there's no way for you to go in and touch or disturb the, the live network. You want to add a, a user, you, you come along with the drop cable that uh, I just described, uh, and you just basically plug it into one of these ports. And now your customer is, uh, is uh, connected. And you haven't had to go in and disturb the live network. Uh, you know, you've got a much sort of lower uh, skilled tech that can go and, and do this job. So it can really speed up the adding uh, of a customer into the network and, and improve the sort of the safety of, of doing that. And there's some of the features of uh, these uh, four, eight and 12 port terminals are there for your uh, reference. So that was, uh, you know, sort of what's going on uh, uh, outside. Uh, let's uh, take a step inside. Now we're talking about uh, you know MDUs or you know, maybe uh, enterprise here, you know, uh, buildings uh, which have multiple endpoints inside requiring it to be connected up. Uh, so nice solution here is sort of based on what's called the retractable cable. And the nice thing about this cable is uh, uh, it's sort of like a cable and a drop cable all combined into one package. And what you you do is, uh, for example, the the under number one there the the, the the picture of the cable with the red, uh, let's say there's a red uh, fiber there. Uh, what you do is you can uh, install the cable first, uh, then you make a window cut at location A and a window cut at location B. Uh, if you cut uh, this unit, this red unit at uh, location A, then you can pull it out at location B. Uh, and now you've, you've basically got your drop cable, which, uh, you know, it's sort of packaged, pre-packaged inside of this uh, uh, tube. And uh, it's called retractable because you're sort of like retracting that, uh, that drop cable out of the, the main cable. Uh, in this case, there isn't any splice at that point where you're accessing uh, the cable. Um, and so you can just run this uh, smaller cable, typically through a, a small duct uh, to, you know, that final endpoint in the, in the building. Um, you know, this is, these are installed inside, so folks are, you know, concerned about the size of these elements and also the appearance. And so, uh, you know, Sterlite uh, and, and others have uh, some nice uh, uh, looking, you know, branching boxes and various uh, elements uh, to make, make the, the solution look nice and, and, and look, uh, work uh, well. If you have a bit of a longer run and you're not able to get enough uh, retracted uh, drop cable out, uh, we also have some nice uh, horizontal drop cables that uh, you know, very discreet, you know, small 1.3 millimeter diameter, uh, typically maybe white, just so they're easy to, to hide in, inside the, the building. So let's go back outside and uh, talk about, uh, you know, not drop cables, we'll go you know, one, one step back in, into the, uh, <clears throat> the distribution and talk about uh, aerial first. Um, some issues with aerial cables is typically they're made to be quite strong, high tensile strength. And uh, um, in addition, figure eight cables, which have a, a metal a strength member, uh, also have some restrictions about not being able to be used uh, near uh, you know, transmission lines and also have requirement for grounding. 
Uh, but in, in any case, both figure eight and ADSS uh, cables are generally uh, designed to be quite uh, strong with, with high tensile strength. Now, if let's say a truck uh, catches the cable or even a tree falls on the cable, uh, the, the cables are strong enough to actually pull down some of the physical infrastructure, pull down poles and uh, can make uh, quite a mess. Uh, uh, you know, if you have to go back and you know, reset a pole or put a new pole in, it's really going to extend your repair time to get that network uh, uh, up and running. And so uh, for, for these reasons and, and maybe some other reasons that I'll, I'll highlight here, um, you know, on the market are available what, what are called sort of work safe uh, construction cables. Uh, the, the key feature of these cables is they're specifically engineered to break at a, a specific load. In, the, in this example, uh, at 2,000 newtons, if you exceed uh, 2,000 newtons, then this cable will break. And that's at a level where rather than pull down the pole, the cable will break. And so you save that infrastructure. Uh, imagine you know, that it's gonna be much quicker to come back with some, some cable and replace the cable than to you know, replace the pole. Uh, and it's not only just that, you know, uh, less, less damage. There's also, you know, a safety factor here as well. Um, you know, uh, a truck catches a pole and maybe a more urban environment, you know, where's that pole going to go? You know, um, much safer to have the, the, the cable break. Uh, while we're at it, uh, you know, uh, might as well make this cable also easy to use. So this particular example is a micro module based cable, which has really nice uh, feature. The tubes inside are, uh, you don't even need a tool to remove the tube from the fiber. Uh, it's, it's quite a, a nice soft uh, cushioning material. It you know, treats the fiber quite nice in terms of uh, you're protecting the fiber, but also you can you know, remove it uh, simply by hand. These tubes also route very nicely inside of splice closures. Uh, so it's, it's a, a favorite of technicians and it, it allows them to do uh, their work uh, uh, faster. Um, as, as these networks become more and more crowded or as uh, we're trying to go back into areas and add more fiber, more cables, then uh, um, you know, compact uh, solutions also bring a lot of value. Uh, so for example, uh, we have uh, a micro ODC closure. So it's really compacted and, and made very efficient in terms of space. Uh, you know, works well with uh, uh, the aerial cable I just talked about, but also micro cables, uh, which we'll, we'll, we'll talk about in a minute in terms of very high density, very small uh, cable form factor. Uh, the micro closure is basically, it's, it's just you know, very small. So uh, this particular example, you can uh, splice up to 96 fibers. So it's quite a lot of splicing in, in a very small uh, area. Uh, nice and sort of a flat profile so it can maybe fit into that last little bit of space that you have uh, um, in, in the manhole. And then obviously it's the IP68 for that uh, application. So we sort of went over the ABCs and some of the you know, solutions uh, uh, to those uh, challenges. And so we'll go on to D, right? We're, don't worry, we're not gonna do the whole alphabet here. We're just doing ABCD. Uh, and so we'll talk about uh, duct space, you know, uh, <clears throat> major you know, sort of challenge because uh, as if we're trying to, you know, if you need 10 times the fiber or whatever, you know, the, the factor is that you feel you need to increase uh, eventually your, your fiber plant, uh, where are you gonna put it? Um, if you are thinking about uh, new ducts, then that's a, a huge uh, investment, right? 80% um, uh, is you know, spent on the, the, the civils for uh, trench digging, et cetera. Uh, the next box there, that's sort of what, you know, you know Sterlite, uh, STL, uh, you know, Corning, Prismia, we, we go after is the material cost. So it's quite, you know, it's, it's a part of it, but it's, it's quite small compared to, you know, what the civil guys are, are asking for, right? And then a, a few other, you know, items, uh, ducts as well, go into sort of the total cost of ownership there. But you absolutely want to avoid, uh, you know, doing anything with uh, new ducts. And so your options are to get more fiber is uh, maybe go with smaller fibers, smaller cables with the uh, you know, same fiber count, or just simply maximize the fiber count in the same sort of diameter cable, a couple of sort of common sense things to, to go after. And so 
Um, just to compare sort of, you know, what tends to be deployed today with what, you know, you can do with uh, miniaturization. Uh, so micro cables. Uh, on the um, left here, we have a, a pretty standard uh, duct, uh, 25 millimeter OD, 20 millimeter ID. Uh, and inside here, we have a very standard 72 fiber loose tube cable of about, you know, 10.6 millimeter in diameter. Now, um, if you are running out of duct space, uh, then you can consider uh, moving to a, a micro cable solution. And I just uh, have one example here where the duct is, is uh, miniaturized, micro duct, 12 millimeter OD, 10 millimeter ID. And uh, the uh, uh, cable that fits inside, uh, eight millimeter diameter, very small, 288 fibers. Uh, this particular cable uh, achieved by moving from a 250 micron fiber to a smaller 200 micron diameter fiber uh, enables uh, you know such a high density of uh, uh, optical uh, fiber in you know such a, a small cable uh, and the various uh, vendors uh, are, are pushing that even further you know down to maybe 180 micron and so nowadays on the market you can get some incredible amount of fiber in a very small <laughs> diameter and uh, you can further leverage that by uh, taking a look at multi-way ducts. And so here, it's not just one duct, it's multiple ducts uh, arranged uh, together that can be deployed all together at, uh, at once. Uh, and so here, you, know, you can start to do the math. Uh, you got a, a seven-way duct, which is quite uh, common, uh, 288 fibers. Uh, so you can fit into here, you know, you know over 2,000 fibers. That's a lot of fiber. Uh, uh, you don't necessarily have to put it all in on day one. Uh, one nice feature about this is you can put in, let's say, three cables today. And then if you have to upgrade, add more capability, you can add more cables uh, later on. Um, and so it's got some nice uh, nice features uh, in that way. But, you know, still, if you load it up, <laughs> you've got 2,000 fibers. That's a lot of fiber to splice. Uh, and uh, the micro cable technology is uh, single fiber uh, based. And so so... If you get to that point, you really want to start taking a look at uh, uh, optical ribbon solutions where you know, one of the main different differentiations is now you splice 12 fibers at a time. And you only have one splice protector location for 12 fibers. So it, it reduces the sort of time to splice. It also reduces uh, the space required to hold all of these the splice protectors and protect these uh, splice joints. Um, and uh, optical ribbon has been around for a while. What is a ribbon? If we look at uh, you know, this picture on the, <laughs> the left, it's, it's flat. In this example, we have 12 fibers sort of all lined up uh, next to each other. Uh, and there's equipment out there, uh, ribbon splicers, where you can strip and cleave all 12 fibers, two ends, put it into the machine, boom, uh, splice uh, 12 fibers at, uh, at one go. Um, and that technology has been around for a while. Uh, the, the traditional technology is a rigid ribbon. Uh, so it's basically a rectangle if you look at it on the end. You can stack a few of those up, uh, put it, but then you have to take this rectangular square and you have to put it into a round tube and you end up wasting a lot of space. So traditional ribbon cables are quite large uh, and actually too large for, for many applications. Um, intermittently bonded ribbon uh, is new. The, the stuff inside the, the second circle there uh, sort of gives you an idea that it's a ribbon, but it also has sort of these uh, holes in it or it, that sort of allow it to roll up into a nice tight bundle. So the difference here for intermittently bonded ribbon is um, it can sort of take whatever space you give it inside the cable. Uh, so you're not trying to stick a, you know, a square stack of ribbons inside a, a round cable. Uh, the intermittently bonded ribbon will uh, sort of form naturally into appropriate shape to, to maximize the use of the space inside of the cable. Uh, here, here is a, just an example from SDL of a Celesta ribbon cable, we call it, available from 288 fiber up to 9,012 fiber. That's a lot of fiber, I know. Uh, and, uh, you know, th this type of product is also, you know, becoming fairly uh, uh, available on the market uh, nowadays. Um, and for obvious reasons, it's... Uh, uh, much smaller than traditional ribbon cable, uh, so 70% lighter, uh, 
about half the size for 2% lower diameter. Uh, the version that, uh, that we, we've put out there is a little bit unique in that it's uh, uh, strong enough for pulling. If you look at the, the cable structure, it's quite simple. It's a nice, robust jacket. Those yellow lines are uh, ARPs, so it's got quite a strong structure, but simple as well, all the fibers in the middle. Uh, so uh, robust cable for, for pulling uh, in the same way that uh, you, know, you can use for a duct cable, uh, but also optimized for, for blowing, sort of like a micro cable so that you can you can blow these cables into ducts for, uh, let's say, two kilometers at, at, at one go. So on the intermittently bonded ribbon, I'll just go over real quickly some of the benefits. Uh, because it's smaller, you can put uh, more uh, uh, cable on the, the, the same size drum. Quite often, uh, operators are limited by, you know, what size of drum they can handle. In this example, uh, Compared to a 400 fiber flat ribbon cable, you can get three kilometer on a typical drum. Uh, and if you go to a 432 IBR, you can get four to six kilometers. So more, more cable on the drum. Uh, two things, uh, you have less logistics, uh, uh, you know, less material to handle, but also you have longer lengths of cable. So you can skip splicing uh, spots and install you know, six kilometer cable instead of maybe three and reduce the amount of splicing that you have to do substantially. Number two here is because the cable is smaller diameter, it's fairly flexible, so you can make smaller coils, you can save space uh, in your, your manholes and handholes. Um, some traditional ribbon cables are so large that uh, I've seen operators install one, man, one manhole for the coil and one manhole for the closure. So, uh, you know, definitely, uh, some, some major savings, especially since the civils uh, are quite uh, expensive. Um, again, for uh, uh, brownfield deployment, where maybe you already have existing ducts, um, I'll, I'll just jump to point number four here first. Um, uh, you can pull these, these cables in. They're, they're much smaller than traditional ribbon cables. Uh, traditional ribbon cable, you can see it on the, the right lower. Um, Pretty much you can only install one 400 fiber ribbon cable into this uh, 50 millimeter ID duct. Whereas the, the IBR cable is much smaller, uh, can either over pull uh, an IBR cable over top of an existing 400 fiber ribbon cable or pull multiple of these into an existing duct. Uh, going back to number three here, uh, the intermittently bonded ribbon is quite flexible and so uh, you're able to fit uh, in, in this type of a tray, in this type of closure, you're able to actually fit two ribbons instead of one. Um, and so that effectively for this kind of closure, this kind of tray, this doubles the capacity of uh, the, the, the closure. Moving on to if you have a, a more of a greenfield situation uh, where you are going to have to install ducts anyway, uh, then the IBR is, uh, is compatible with uh, uh, you know, smaller duct uh, or micro duct uh, situations. So for example, the um, uh, flat ribbon where you see the red axis, uh, it's, it's just too big to go into a, you know, a, a, a normal uh, duct size or micro duct size. Whereas the IBR, if you're, you're thinking about deploying, a, let's say a 24 millimeter OD, 20 millimeter ID um, uh, duct system, then the IBR is uh, well suited to go inside uh, that duct system and is sort of optimized to blow two kilometers at a single shot in, in that uh, ducting system, which sort of gets to the point six here that uh, there's a significant uh, savings in moving from, you know, uh, pulling cable to, to blowing cable, uh, you know, much, much uh, quicker in this particular case uh, you know, somewhere between six times and, and four and a half times faster to uh, blow cable versus uh, pulling it for you know, a two kilometer uh, install. And then finally, sort of going back to the, the benefits, uh, you know, combining the intermittently bonded ribbon with uh, the stellar uh, fiber, uh, you can, you know, reduce uh, O&M calls, uh, have a, you know, a more robust uh, network, uh, easier first time uh, deployment, 
Uh, and then number eight here is also a you know, reminder that yes, you also get uh, uh, sort of future proofing of the network uh, due to the much uh, improved uh, performance in the, the L band or at the longer wavelengths. All right, so just sort of summarizing that particular combination of stellar fiber and intermittently bonded ribbon uh, really you know, shows that you can uh, increase the rollout speed of the network. You can get twice as much uh, fiber in the same area uh, and overall reduce the, you know, the, the cost of uh, uh, cable kilometer uh, deployed. All right, so just sort of in summary to look back at the, you know, the, the areas where we, we touched on. Um, we touched on uh, aerial uh, solution. Uh, well, first off, we, we, we introduced a, a new fiber, and I believe that this type of fiber, no kidding, will uh, eventually become uh, you know, a standard uh, for, for, certainly for ro robust uh, deployments, uh, high density areas. I, th I think it has uh, the potential to, to become sort of the universal fiber that's used everywhere. Uh, and I, I mentioned again, yeah, we were the first one out with it, but uh, other large uh, guys also have uh, it available too. So I really think it's gonna be uh, used everywhere. One of our customers sort of sums it up. He says, I can use this fiber everywhere. And so I think it's, uh, it's going to take off. We went over uh, you know, some unique uh, underground, underground solutions. We, we talked about you know, uh, convenient ways to deploy optical fiber in MDUs uh, and some, some new uh, drop cable uh, solutions uh, as well. So, um, you know, recommend you, you, you work with, you know, suppliers out there who can uh, go all the way back to the fiber. They can provide you optimal fiber solutions. Uh, they also have the, the cable capability to provide you some unique cable solutions. Uh, and then add on to that the, the um, it, optical interconnect kits. I think uh, if you, uh, you know, work with suppliers uh, in, in that set of range, that uh, you know, you, the, the end solutions that you have for your networks will be, will be much easier to deploy, faster deployment, um, and then give you more, more fiber in the, in the same space. All right. And so, uh, you know, this is. Uh, what we're sort of challenged to, to try to, to, to do, right? Faster network rollout, uh, more fiber, get fiber everywhere, uh, have a nice ro robust network uh, that's not gonna keep us up at night and uh, all at the same time work together to try to see how we can reduce the cost of uh, the network uh, build out. Okay, so that's uh, the end of my slides. Uh, really thank you for your attention and I'll turn it over to the moderator to see if uh, uh, I skipped over something, any clarifications you need, any questions you need to the answer. Oh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Selden. I, I can't thank you enough. And uh, Ms. Nawal from Sterlite for this informative webinar and for your time. And we hope all the attendees enjoyed it and learned as much as I did today. And uh, Congratulations and best of luck for all the new products Sister Light is working on. Um, uh, so um, I just have uh, one question from uh, Etani. She asked about what real estate is represented by icons connected by a ring. Uh, she saw the CO and the street cabinets. So what real estate is uh, represented by those icons? Um, could you repeat? We're coming in and out uh, the audio. Sorry, sh should I repeat again? Please, please. Yes. I'm going to put so, my video on off. Okay. Uh, so, um, Ethany, she, she was asking about what real estate is represented by icons connected by a ring. She saw the CO and the street cabinets. So what real estate is represented by those icons? Uh, I think that's just a, a, um, a connection point. Um, in some cases, just uh, you know, uh, trunk cables spliced together in uh, uh, underground uh, manhole. Um, 
Uh, so all, all passive, all passive, no, no, no active, uh, just, just, you know, fiber splicing connection points. That's all. Okay. So I think this is the question that we have, uh, Dr. Selden. Thank you very much. And thanks uh, for all our attendees today and uh, looking forward to welcoming you all. Uh, sorry, we have another, another question. Um, Estelia designed to support and be competitive, com compatible with the legacy of uh, G652D. However, if we have now a large network with G657A1 fiber, so how Stella can be also compatible with it or it's not compatible? Thanks. Okay, that's a, that's a great uh, question. Uh, so what is uh, the difference between D and A1 fiber in general? Uh, A1 is some fairly minor tweaks to the D recipe, if you will, uh, to in, ensure uh, a better uh, level of bend performance. Uh, so basically, like in, in our case, our, our, the, the core of our D fiber and the core of our A1 fiber is very similar. Actually, uh, our, um, one of our highest selling fibers is called a Nova fiber. That is a D slash A1 fiber. Uh, and so basically the mode field diameter of A1 fiber for most uh, suppliers is also the same as, as D5. It's, it's other details of, of uh, how the, 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 the fiber is made that give you the, 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 the lower bend loss. So in summary, yes, uh, Stellar is also compatible, backward compatible with, with A1 fiber uh, because the cores are basically still, the mode field diameter is the same, the cores are the same. Great. We have another question. Uh, how uh, 2016 optical cables are resolved into 12 cables? Um, could you repeat the question? I'm not sure I understand. Yeah. How um, 2016 optical cables are resolved into 12 cables? You can see the question in the chat area, Dr. Selden. It's yeah. from storage. Okay, one second. I need to find the slide of questions so I can. Okay. I think that was, uh, I can't find the slide here right at the moment, but I think that was um seven cables and uh 288 fibers each i think that's where that comes from okay so someone is typing i don't know if anybody has another question also for dr selden All right. Uh, there's another question, Dr. Selden, um, from Shukri also. Uh, we could not see the joint closure for high fiber count cable. Uh, let's say cable over 800 fiber cores. Do you have or is it under development since operator did not yet went for such kind of cable? Um, yes, um, we have a, a full line of... Uh, 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 closures, um, in particular for the internally bonded ribbon, uh, because you are uh, able to, you know, group 12 fibers together in one splice location, one splice protector, then, you know, for the high fiber count cable, that is uh, much easier to accommodate uh, high uh, uh, splice points because you're sort of consolidating by a factor of, of 12. So yes, for our high fiber count cables, uh, in particular, intermittently bonded ribbon, we do have uh, appropriate splice uh, closures for those uh, those cables. Okay, uh, I guess uh, we have also someone is typing. Let's see. All right. So um, thank you, Shokri, also for your questions, and um, thank you, Dr. Selden. Thank you, Nawal. Thank you for all our attendees. We will. We are looking forward to welcoming you all to our next webinar. We will announce all the details soon. Have a nice day, everybody. And uh, as we said, we will share uh, uh, the, the recorded uh, webinar with all of our attendees. So thank you very much, Dr. Selden.
It's our pleasure to have you again. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, also, uh, uh, just let everyone know, let's, uh, we have a lot of work to do, so let's go get busy. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Silva. Have a nice day. Thank All you. Right. Okay.